Foot Clan, I love this show. Each and every year we want to, well, we need to remember some things. That's the truth. We have 10 of them on the show today. Do not miss it. Don't forget. Oh, Foot Clan, so happy everybody's getting back into fantasy football. It is clearly the middle of fantasy football season. We are now in the middle. Very, very close. It yes. is. I mean, we're here. I feel like it's right around the corner. And you know what? We've got the ultimate draft kit all ready for pre-sale available. We're at, a, at the lowest price you can get it. And we have two weeks left of our monster pre-package bundle giveaway. Not only is it the lowest price you can get, and you know you're going to get it anyways, but you have a chance to win the first Listener League entry if you get it before March 1st. So go to ultimatedraftkit.com. You won't be disappointed. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. Welcome in, welcome back. Back to business. Business time. The business of getting down. All three of us. What? To business. Yes. That's why they call it business time. (laughs) It's business. (laughs) Tuesday, February 18th. Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, Mike, the fantasy hitman, right? The fantasy footballers back with you all together. No, Jay Grizz. Get out of my face, Jay. Oh, yeah, careful. Say, say that to his face. Yes. I would never do that. It's a very large bear we're talking about. He's actually a great listener. Like I've, I've, I I've, do appreciate that. They say find the good part of someone. I've expressed many problems to Jay Grizz, just one-on-one. He always listens? Always. That's the kind of social interaction you prefer, the, no. the silent kind. He's like my therapist now. Yeah, you would ride in elevators all day with Jay Grizz. Well, that might be dangerous. <laughs> Excited to be back. Uh, our family took a few days, got out of town. Uh, if, if you saw my Twitter feed, mm-hmm. you saw how defeated I was at the very end of that trip. I wasn't actually defeated. I was just tired. I'm old, and my kids are young. Uh, and that disparity yes. is really what held me up at the. And my son won a very large Sonic the Hedgehog uh, stuffed animal. Where at, at Knott's Berry Farm? What's the status of said giant life-size Sonic? We left it in California. <laughs> <laughs> Congrats on the win. We realized when we were packing up the vehicle. Yeah, does it even fit in the car? Do you have an extra seat? I thought about strapping him to the roof. I thought that would have been a really entertaining ride. It wouldn't be entertaining for the person behind you who all of a sudden has a <laughs> sonic, sonic flying at, at light speed at their windshield and explodes. Yeah. Is that some kind of promotion for the new movie? <laughs> <laughs> why, why is Sonic? <laughs> oh, yeah. Hashtag not a sponsor. Yeah. Yeah. I. What, are, you, are you fishing for the Sonic the Hedgehog no, movie no, sponsorship? I'm, let, I'm letting the people out there know that we're not sneakily promoting Sonic the Hedgehog coming out to theaters near you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to see it now that they fixed the way Sonic looks? Yeah. Not a sponsor. I will. I'll, I'll see it. <laughs> oh, the, the, the Ron Tomatoes. Oh, it's got Jim Carrey in it. Yeah. Yeah, so that's you know good reason. reason. The tomato score so far is it okay. It sounds like we're doing an ad now. Thanks, no, now Mike. we're just being deads. Yeah, seriously, not a sponsor, but it does come out. On, <laughs> no, I don't Look, even know. <laughs> it's actually it's uh, already out, fellas. Is it really? Oh, for real? <laughs> yeah. Whoops. Yeah, clearly not a sponsor. Really enjoyed it. I mean, I've already seen it. So Great. back in town, I enjoyed listening to you guys talk about fantasy football on my drive. Uh, we had a good time. Jason, you're healthy again. Everybody's back in business. And we have, we've got a great show today. We have 10 things to remember from 2019. We do this show every year. We each pick out a few things that we think are worthwhile in terms of just surfacing, remembering, looking back over the course of the year. And this is a very selfish show. Like I don't. I was talking to Mike about this, hmm. as opposed to. I mean, most of the time we're giving, we're giving, we're giving. Ab- we're right. so selfless. Absolutely, I'm usually doing this show for the Foot Clan, but I don't do this show for the Foot Clan. I do this show for me. This is genuinely 100. percent I am trying to remind me of what, <laughs> uh, like the things that I don't want to forget this year, and the, and they are helpful every time that I declare these things i i use them in the season but i i it's obviously still helpful because <laughs> if i think i should remember them 
Hopefully you think you should remember them, but I'm just, I'm letting everybody know. Like, this is genuinely what I want to remember for going into 2020. Yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be a good show. You can subscribe to this podcast. It's so easy. It's free. Anywhere you listen to podcasts, click that subscribe button. We appreciate your reviews, your support. You can follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. Find out exactly what's going on around these parts. And I highly encourage everyone to follow the Instagram feeds, Instagram.com slash fantasy footballers. You can also follow our personals at Andy Holloway. All ice cream all the time. At FF Hitman. It's mostly shoes and video games. And Jason is at Jason FFL. It's and our um, and our um, Twitter handles are the same, but the big news. You actually posted Jay- on Instagram. Not just once. Oh, you saw. Yes, I saw. I'm back, baby. Jason is an IG mogul now. Who's just Wait, posting. he's done it twice? He's got two posts. Yeah. What yeah. was great is in our Slack channel last night, Jason like brought up some things that he saw on Instagram, like they were breaking news. <laughs> and these were things that had <laughs> been that? around for like over a year. And he's like, what? What happened here? Look, what happened I, on this thing? Did you, guys, did you guys hear about this? I have not and been. I'm like, Mike and I've seen this for years. I have not been on Instagram, but I'm, but I'm there now. So follow. Do you and, feel enjoy. like you are, um, you can do some things for the gram now? Yeah. Whoa, you gotta yeah, do it absolutely. for the gram. I'm gonna do things for the gram. All right. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, the, and we're not talking about like your grams, your your grandmama. It's the gram or no. like golden grams. I just think candy <laughs> grams. Oh, and so I'm in candy like, gram. If yeah. this is a candy gram, I'm in. Let's do some buy sell. Buy or sell presented by Pristine Auction. All right, buy or sell. Will DK Metcalf hit 1,000 receiving yards in year number two? Hmm. Impressive rookie season. Metcalf and uh, Mr. Tyler Lockett accounted for 42% of the targets for the Seahawks last year. We saw Will Disley go down during part of the year. Mm Mm-hmm. There are some rumors. I don't know if you know this. There's some rumors about Greg Olson yeah. and the Seattle Seahawks. Really? Yeah. Also the Redskins and one other team, which I will get to eventually here. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Metcalf and Lockett were really the only show in town. It was Buffalo. Was it Buffalo? Yes. Oh, okay. So what do you think? A thousand receiving yards on a run first offense, but obviously that is not a bar that is unattainable especially for a player that i think is going to have a you know a pretty decent amount of big plays i i i'll just i'll go first because this is uh an easier one for me it's a clear buy i i definitely will project dk metcalf for a thousand yards next season he was a he had 900 last year exactly he was raw i mean we all knew this and and he impressed me in that he was more complete as a wide receiver from a route tree than what i you know he didn't he didn't show that in college he came in and he did enough to where he got 900 yards as as a rookie and it wasn't until about uh week eight where he started getting up in the 90 percents of snaps and so i I think he takes a step forward as a as an actual NFL player, as a wide receiver. And if he does that, he's got the body, the style, so the what is quarterback. That? Does he go raw, like raw to some medium rare to yeah. medium? Mm. Yeah. Medium I, well? I think he's going to jump from raw to medium next year. And also <laughs> keep in mind that – A good meat joke. <laughs> uh I'm sorry. It's been a few, <laughs> been you're a, a few you're episodes. Out of yeah. One of the <laughs> – one of the 62 and a half yards a game and the reason why you know you would sell this is the offense is the fact that this is not a pass first offense this is a running and defense desiring team um and and the thing is is Russ has come out this off season and I'm sure you guys have seen the quotes I've he's, seen his picture I've seen the, <laughs> oh, yes man. I've seen the photos of him getting glammed up yeah, he looked. Uh, he's got a. He's certainly got a look Ky- going. Was that his Kylo Ren? Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> what was that? I'm not sure. Mike, you said it. That is exactly how I would look if, um, <laughs> I was trying. I'm so glad too you look, hard. Like, if I was just like I am. Like some people are just not. It's not possible to get to a certain level of cool. Like you're just too. You're well, too nerdy, right? Like I'm just too. It's and it's not about being too cool. It's about going out of 
a range where you are comfortable. I mean, it's good to get out of your comfort zone, but like when it comes to wearing things, especially publicly, you can look into a man's eyes and say, do you feel comfortable in what you're wearing right now and how you look? And he yeah. did not pass that test. I was it was wearing, last year's fedora week right? when it was yeah. like some look, some, some people guys can wear a fedora. Not this one. A perfect like I would look how Russ looked if I tried to do that. <laughs> like I posted that picture of myself in Knott's Berry Farm wearing a pair of Nikes, and I got criticism because the Nikes were too tight. I was like, yeah, that's my the that's, Nikes were too yeah. Tight? I tightened my that? Nikes too tight. What? People saw this from a picture and went. You, you betcha. What? And I was like, you know, Mike's the kind of guy who wears his Nikes loose. I wear mine tight. I'm a little more tight. I've, I don't even think about it. I just wear them comfortable. Well, now I feel cool. All right. But <laughs> anyway, so, you were talking about yes, Russell yeah, Wilson so, but, and so, not how he looks. I, I will jump in here with, with a point I want, uh, that I want to ask you here. Is Tyler Lockett going to hit 1,000 yards? Yes. Okay, so that's, think, that's an think, easy yes. Yeah, I think both guys will hit a thousand yards this year, and and this goes to what I was about to say about Russell Wilson. He's okay. come out this this off season uh -huh. and talked about how he dominates the two minute drill. He dominates the up tempo. Are offense. you speaking? Russ is speaking about himself. Russell or he's talking Wilson. About Metcalf? Russell Wilson is talking about Russell Wilson. Oh, Russell he's not talking Wilson. in the third person. Oh man, he's not talking to the third person. He's just saying, look. We we really excel when we put the defense on on the on the defensive and we go. It's care, careful where you put it on a their heels, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and you know you we put we're, that defense we're on the offense is what you got to do. That's we're, real dangerous. Sorry, we're up tempo and we're um, you know getting them tired and that they always succeed in those roles. And he said he he wishes he came right out and said I wish we were more of a team like that, like Kansas City where we're, you know, just scoring as many points as we can. And, well, I don't think that's going to make Pete Carroll go, well, then let's do that. The squeaky wheel, you know, th that that matters. And I think they're going to throw the ball a little bit more than they did this year. And I think they'll have the weapons in DK Metcalf season two to do it. So, yeah, I think I think they both have 1,000-yard seasons. If you looked at his hair, the squeaky wheel already got the grease. Ew, yeah. it got a lot of grease. Very, but very oily. <laughs> I will buy DK Metcalf with a 1,000 receiving yards in year two. I was very impressed with him. This is a team that knows how to use him. Russell Wilson is a you know play extender, and DK is a seemingly very hardworking complement for Russell Wilson. I think by uh, maybe, you know, not much above a thousand, but I think a thousand is fair. And let me ask you guys this: How many times has Russell Wilson sustained two thousand yard receivers? I would guess zero because it was Doug Baldwin and nobody else for the I, majority. I would guess zero based on the tone of your voice. The answer is zero. <laughs> and it's not just—it's not you can't just say well lack of talent. But well, he had Lockett and Baldwin. He had Lockett and Baldwin. He had Lockett and Jimmy Graham. Like Jimmy Graham was okay for a little bit. In Seattle, that was the closest they got where Baldwin was over 1,100 and Jimmy Graham was at 923. I guess if you don't count this year, like Metcalf had the 900. And I honestly, I don't care what Russell Wilson's saying about how great he is in the two-minute drill because Brian Schottenheimer doesn't care and Pete Carroll doesn't care. They want to win football games and they have their plan of how they win football games. So I just like – Metcalf definitely has the talent – and it could be real, real close that they both just hit yeah. over a thousand yards. I, th that's certainly it was close the, this year. It's certainly in the realm of possibilities. I'm just it's, and I I think I will buy it because of the ascending talent of DK Metcalf. Of he is a big play guy, so he'll have these games where he hits 150 yards every once in a while. The but, odds are, in but your it's not an easy buy for me. The odds are in your favor slightly historically. The, uh, Metcalf was one of 41 players. All time to have at least 900 receiving yards as a rookie. We also saw A.J. Brown and Terry McLaurin do it in 2019. Of the remaining 38 who did it, 20 of them did not hit 1,000 in year two. That's good stuff. So, uh, yeah. I think he's got a shot. So, we've got bye-bye sell? No, no. I'm, no, I'm buying, but bye -bye I'm saying bye. it's not. This is a backstreet <laughs> boys. Oh. What? Oh, did I, did I get that wrong? Yeah. Jason. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you did. Jason. You want another shot? Yeah, uh, this is an in sync Holy situation. Holy freaking crap, dude. You cannot you cannot confuse Backstreet and In Sync. Well, you, you I can't. believe I sure you, can. You, you no, you can. can. Okay. Yes, it's it's you can. They said it couldn't be done. I just did it. 
you, but you should be embarrassed. And like, that's well, a mark Mike of shame upon your house right, forever. Look, Mike we're is in, taking that very hard. We're in sync about this now. Thank okay? you. Thank you. You're welcome. That was Bye 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 or Sell <laughs> from Pristine Auction. PristineAuction.com. Use the code BALLERS when you sign up. You get a $10 credit. See, that's what you got to do when you go to Pristine Auction. You just buy, buy, buy. <laughs> That's, this is good. Honestly, good that's stuff. how I've treated them. That the is past. how you've treated the website. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going to move on to our 10 things to remember from 2019. Before we do that, I want to thank today's sponsor. We're talking about the ever mouthwatering HelloFresh, the number one meal kit in all of, not just the state, America. Ooh. All of America. They make cooking at home fun, easy, affordable. What I like is the stress reduction factor of HelloFresh. I don't want to think about buying every ingredient no. and figuring out that stuff and how long it takes everything that you get from hello fresh you can enjoy you know getting dinner on the table in like 30 minutes or 20 minutes with some of their quicker option options that they have something for everybody you got low calorie options vegetarian options family friendly recipes uh we've done it before we're like you know we figure out the kids and then we just the wife and i we do the hello fresh meal and they've got more five star recipes than any other meal kit absolutely love them and you can go to hellofresh.com slash footballers 10 and use the code footballers 10 for 10 free meals including free shipping that's hellofresh.com slash footballers 10 and code footballers 10 for 10 free meals including free shipping breaking news this da, da, important da, 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 da. this important psa is brought to you by manscaped dot com after more than eight I'm listening after more than eighteen months of research and development, the Manscaped engineering team has confirmed that they have successfully created the greatest men's downstairs trimmer of all time. The new and improved Lawnmower 3.0 Manscaping trimmer is now available available for purchase. The third gen Manscaped trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to prevent manscaping accidents. And, fellas, those are accidents that are not acceptable in no. your life. Look, sometimes an accident happens. You cannot have an accident happen ah! when you are <laughs> on manscaping. And, look, if you have the lawnmower 2.0, it's an easy transition because it's the same replacement blade. The battery is going to last up to 90 minutes. I've got the lawnmower. I had the lawnmower 2.0. I got the 3.0 now. I've upgraded. Likewise. Smooth sailing, smooth riding. Better than Russell Wilson 3.0. <laughs> Go on. We'll see. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code FOOTBALLERS at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code FOOTBALLERS. And always, your downstairs will thank you. Don't forget to remember these things. <laughs> you know, we get asked a lot, what's our favorite drop? I don't. We don't get asked a lot. Like, what's your worst? What's the worst drop? That might. That might what? take the cake. I'm saying not. Not. Not just musically. I'm not. I'm not, not just music. I'm not oh, throwing. Okay. A, I'm not throwing you. I'm saying the the oh. phrase. Don't forget to not remember. Like what? You probably wrote it. I probably did because it sounds oh, like something. I, 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 I 100 percent wrote it. I I definitely wrote that. So I take great offense to it, but it's funny. <laughs> It's ZZ Top, baby. Yeah, that's spectacular. Wait, I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear the phrase. Don't forget to remember these things. It's a Jason Morrison at its best. It's on brand in every way, <laughs> shape, and form. That so you saying that's the worst drop we have? You are looking in the mirror and saying you are the worst. Public speaker of all time. Guilty as charged. I feel like you were ba that drop is our show encapsulated. <laughs> well, that's not good. <laughs> all right. 2019 has come and gone. We want to remember some things from last year. Uh, and uh, we're going to count them down. 10 things to remember. I'm going to kick this thing off. Number 10. All right, number 10, I'm going to just call this uh, hype check. And I know this is – I'm going to give a shout-out to Brooks because he uh, was paying close attention to this this past year, surfaced it yesterday. It's tough, man. And it is really tough. And I don't even know 
what exactly you guys can help me with this i don't know exactly what i want you to remember let's work through it but let's work through this and that is basically looking at the team hype that we end up we end up in this situation every year and what i think i want people to remember out there is that the nfl is full of very smart people very smart defensive coordinators uh head coaches that get no sleep that spend all of their time watching film and diagnosing the next great thing in the NFL offensively. And last season, we came in once again with the team hype train around certain teams. You could talk about Baker and Beckham and Landry and Freddie Kitchens and all the hype that surrounded the Cleveland Browns. Chubb and Hunt. And- yeah, I mean, this is an unstoppable offense. You could look at Matt Nagy and his historical success and Jordan Howard's out the door and then, you know, Judge Giamatti was sending me screenshots of Roto World updates about David montgomery from the draft and how he's the next cream hunt and the team is in love with him and everything he's going to represent with the hype of the chicago bears offense you could look at the team hype of teams like the los angeles rams and the kansas city chiefs right but when push came to shove the rams it didn't work out if you were brandon cook's owner or a robert woods owner unless it was the second half of the season and you had jared goff fall off in terms of fantasy production consistency you struggled with Gurley and his consistency and the the workload in production. You could look at the offense. Oh, you always have to trust Andy Reid. You always have to trust anybody surrounding Patrick Mahomes. Well, Mahomes had struggles with consistency, had the injury. Sammy Watkins was a disaster <laughs> for your team. Travis Kelsey was – What he did is just – it is unthinkable. And, and he, he had the, the week know. one that he had. And it wasn't just – this was like a fluky thing. Okay, Sammy Watkins broke open for three deep touchdowns because there was a defensive lapse. Like, he was making guys miss. Well, he is, looked so good. He looked fantastic. It was against Jacksonville, too, I believe. Yes, it was. And yet, even even Kelsey, who was very good, like on the scale of tight ends, he was good. But what you drafted him to be, maybe he didn't live up to that expectation. Damian Williams was obviously not somebody that you could, yeah. you know, plug and play, although you thought that you could. In your playoff challenges, he worked out. Just like Sammy Watkins <laughs> and other players. <laughs> But but the team hype is something very difficult to diagnose. And I think it is our job to look at the situations around the NFL. That's the whole essence of fantasy, right? That's the fun of fantasy is trying to project who the next team will be. And last year we saw the Ravens and the 49ers become these, you know, uh, leaders in points per game. And are these the two teams that are going to be overhyped heading into 2020? Those are the type of questions that you have to look at. But basically just recognizing the fact that there is going to be a difference between hype and delivering on the hype from year to year. Okay. Okay. So I think that that's one of those things that, sure. uh, you know, they what, remember the Titans. Let's remember the Browns. Let's remember mm. that there are uh, two sides mm. to that coin. And that movie's not as uh, emotionally fulfilling. Remember the Browns. Yeah. Remember the Browns. No, yeah, that one's no, just no. like sad, sad, not like yeah. a sad, happy. Yeah, some, some bad Chipotle. <laughs> All right, moving on. Number nine. All right, on this one, I'm titling. I'm titling my stuff this year um, without catchy phrases, and you'll see why on my next one. But this is called "Wait on Injuries." Wait, Jason, Jason Moore, you are the man who gave this world world no risk it, no biscuit. And biscuits lead to diabetes. That's it was like so you were good. the man who that, brought that to us. Uh, absolutely. And now you're. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're taking Don't that from us. Uh, look, I, I'm. Th- these are important to me, Mike. And these are important. So to wait, remember. you're not naming them because because I want to actually remember them. And I'll, I'll here. All right, I'll, I'll, I'm just trying to figure it out. Well, I'll tell you on my next tip All why right. I am doing this. But proceed. Tip number nine is. Wait on injuries. Be patient. Last year, I one of the things I wanted to remember was not buying the injury dip in the draft season. Well, that worked out tremendously. A.J. Green was off my board. I saw him as another Doug Baldwin trap, and he never even got back on the field. Oh, great. You got a one-round savings. That worked out. But then what happened as the season went on, over and over and over, you saw these players who were injured who came back, and what happened is, well, if they're playing, you've got to play them, right? Mm-hmm. Remember, David Johnson was coming back from injuries. Like, well, you got look, if he's active, you've got to play him. 
how'd Chase Edmonds do that that right. week? You know, Adam Thielen was coming back, and you'd want to play him. And then it was like, no, he's oh well, no, he's not coming back. Then he finally comes back. He's He's barely out there. You had it over and over. James Don't, Connor did it. it. Well, James Connor was the reason that early in the season, I talked to Brooks. I said, hey, on this year's things to remember, I want to remember for next year, that for my rankings on a weekly basis, for me as a player, when a guy is coming back off of an injury, if I can pivot, I'm going to pivot. Because there were too many examples this last year, whether it was DJ or Thielen or Devonta Freeman, James Connor, Austin Hooper, that week back from injury – they're not as involved, and and it really hurt you a lot. And and likewise, you saw with uh, Saquon and Alvin Kamara. This kind of goes into it a little bit when you have these serious injuries and people come back and they are playing. It it takes time. Like these are these are actual human beings. I know they're kind of superhuman, but if you are injured, you're not as effective. It's and it, very difficult though to do it with anybody that you counted on to play. To put a guy on your bench and pivot away from these names, like you said, Saquon or Connor or players that were supposed to be foundational, I just think it will be a very difficult mental challenge. So the practical advice here is if you're talking about the Camaras and the Saquon, specific to the high ankle sprain, I am going to next year during the high ankle sprain season for whoever gets it. Is that like flu season? Yeah. I'm I'm going to be much more cautious of their performance in the month following them returning because both guys were subpar. They were okay. They, they didn't destroy you. They didn't come back and were terrible, but they weren't what you drafted. They weren't superstars. So I'm going to keep that in mind next year. But everybody a tier below that, which James Conner, Adam Thielen, even DJ, they were a tier below. I, I am going to, you know, I mean, obviously if you don't have another starter, you can't, but I'm going to bench him. I'm going to wait and say, mm. I want a week break because had you done this that that this last year, you would have scored more fantasy points. I know it's hard to do. That's why we make it a thing to remember. So that's number nine. I'm going to wait on injuries next year. There's just there's no reason to say let me have the injured guy. There's other uninjured right. guys. All right. Number eight. Free agency is fun, but be careful. Like, we all love free agency. You're, we're going to have shows that focus on free agency because that is fun to do. I was already – I'm already there, Mike. I, yeah. I told – I was looking at my dynasty team, and I thought about Robbie Anderson maybe yes. landing on the Philadelphia Eagles, and I it's, said, that's a good place. That's a good home. I need him there. It's what could be. And, like, specifically, I want to focus on the wide receivers of – and, like, that – I'm with you. I'm a Robert uh, – I'm a Robbie Anderson truther. I think that he can succeed. Now, he's in a little bit of a different situation because he's, he's he's trapped in the black hole. He's trapped by Adam Gaze, and we've seen what happens when players leave or Adam Gaze leaves them. They've had, <laughs> they've had a great history of success recently, but here are the big-ticket wide receivers from it's last year. It's called the black year. hole bounce back. Yes. <laughs> More like That's... the brown hole bounce back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I thought uh, about it, and then I passed. <laughs> I'll take it on. Yeah, it's yours. Tyrell Williams, he was the one who got paid by the Raiders. How'd that work out for fantasy? Golden Tate, now he had his four-game suspension, but even still, the, the guys who actually had some success, surprisingly, were the guys who headed off to the, to the Buffalo Bills in Cole Beasley and John Brown, but even then it wasn't like this is a tremendous amount of success for players who got big paydays. I mean, John Brown was a three-year, $27 million deal. And these guys, it it wasn't what you had hoped for. Meanwhile, the running backs, if a running back got a, a substantial contract, they at least had a little stints, at least, of value. But the value went down. Lev Bell, we know what happened to him. Mark Ingram was kind of the outlier who turned into a monster all year long. But the point is simply, it's not that it's impossible for it to work out for a free agent. It's just we get really, really excited and only see the positives of the team change and not factoring the, the human element. This guy is moving. He might be moving his entire family across the country. He's learning a new he's, playbook. He's learning a new playbook. He's learning a new, in, a whole entire new life. These are things that we don't think about at all. Imagine yourself moving from California. Okay, now you're up in the Northeast. Do you even know how to live in snow? I mean, like, these... 
it, you're like, well, that's off the field. But like these are all factors that we should be considering for these players. They're men. They're human beings. Got got to get internet set up at your new house. Oh, that's the that, you got to cancel your be, old internet. Yeah, that could be a real problem. DMV. Find a new primary care physician. Oh, give give up on that. I'm just <laughs> doctorless. Yeah, I'm not even going to worry about that. No, it, it is part of the fun of the off season. Yes, and we will, I don't I don't want to rain completely it. on it. We will do it. Yes, but, but we've brought that up before. This is not a first time event. We've right. brought up the fact that. It is very difficult historically to be a free agent wide receiver and land in a new location after you've had success more so right. and end up, you know, projecting that forward. And we even saw, you know, even in the middle of the year, Emmanuel Sanders made the move. It's a very difficult thing to get consistency out of a new location because you are kind of finding your way through. Yeah, absolutely. Number seven. All right. This one's very interesting because it is something I want to remember. And it is something that I am learning has changed, I believe, over the past 10 years of fantasy football. There was a mindset that I had, and I'm titling this, Talent Can Win Out. Don't let defeat defeat you, okay? Mm. I'm going to tell you what I mean. But here's, I, I always had a lot of success in fantasy leaning on what I perceive to be always the best offense, always the best team, draft players on winning teams, at least let that be the majority of, of your roster, more reliability, consistency. But I think what we saw this last year in, in a lot of cases was talent and opportunity does not require a team to have a, a winning record. There were a lot of players, and every, you know, every name I'm about to list, five wins or fewer for their team. Devontae Parker, Joe Mixon, Austin Eckler, Terry McLaurin, Kenny Galladay, Darius Slayton, Christian McCaffrey, Kenyon Drake. If you discount them, in the modern NFL, if you discount players and their situations because they're on losing teams, I think you end up doing it at your own peril anymore because you can't let the sludge that is that team's overall you know, success dissuade you from taking a chance on them. It was an easy thing to do with a lot of these rookie wide receivers that did have success because they were going to bad teams and bad situations. But in this modern NFL in the in the prevent defense era, players on losing teams are thriving week in and week out, even with bad quarterbacks, right? You talk about Kenny Galladay being a fairly consistent player with going through multiple quarterbacks on a bad team. Even pathetic offenses, teams with no hope, are putting forth players week in and week out that have provided some success and consistency. The success McLaurin had with a couple of different quarterbacks. Kenyon Drake, you know, the Cardinals were not a very good team. He comes in and instantly has success uh, against formidable defenses. And the fact that you end up with a quarter or a quarter and a half of garbage time, look, we're going to come in and hit that garbage time. Uh, oh, the garbage man can drop. And Jace is going to go on rants about how he saw how a game was supposed to go. <laughs> but then the last two drives of the game ruins his projection. But that's today's NFL. That's just going to happen. And if, a, if talent is there, it only takes one play. That's the thing we saw with Galladay consistently. Even on Thanksgiving Day, right? One play with David Blau. The, the Bears basically shut Detroit down the entirety of the game. But it was one play to make a player's week. Devontae Parker did it over and over again with the volume. Even Joe Mixon went absolutely mad over the back half of the year. Yes, he did. On a team that had no offensive line, had no chance of victory. So I, it's something I want to be more mindful of because I think – Part of the way that the the NFL favors offenses now changes maybe a little bit of that dependency on the winning team. Yeah, I I, I think that that applies primarily to pass catchers, um, and and including running backs, right? Like Christian McCaffrey, uh, obviously was phenomenal. A lot of that was was in the pass catching area. If you look at you know the top twelve running backs this last year, the only two that were really on bad teams. Uh, were incredible pass catching running backs, or at least the volume was. You're talking McCaffrey and Eckler. McCaffrey and Eckler, and I would I would throw, uh, even though he's he's not the most talented uh, receiving back. Um, oh, Fournette, Leonard Fournette. Well, sure. I, Fournette was one of them, but then like Chubb was good on a six win team. <clears throat> uh, Joe Mixon over the back half. I think what my problem is is buying in. My problem is saying like, okay, yes, they can have a good game. They can have another good game. But you keep waiting for the shoe to drop on the bad team. And at least for some of these players, you didn't have that shoe drop. Yeah. But I think you were right. I mean, a lot of those names that I read off 
were were the pass catching options and the running backs that are out there on third down for two quarters of prevent makes you know a lot of sense. So we'll move on. Number six. All right, here's the important title. Oh yes, I've been waiting. Don't overreact to week one. Witty. Now very witty. I'm not exactly sure what you mean. Okay. Yeah, mm. I understand. What I'm saying by what I mean is I mean that I I don't want you okay, so far or so me to make too big of a deal mm. over the first week of the season. Is that a better way to say that? Don't overreact to week one. And the reason why I am titling it so obviously is because this would have been such great advice to remember last year. Yeah, actually, it, it was. And it was one of the things to remember last year. It was the end yeah. is the beginning is the end. Yeah. That was the title. Oh, that was the problem. We had a title is the problem. The beginning is the... What does that mean? We I don't know. SEO well, I, did, I did explain it. Well, but I, I didn't just say it. I don't <laughs> listen. I'm off in la-la land here. Okay, I'm a fair enough. I'm a, I'm a look at the headlines type of guy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good bit. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, look, don't... It happened last year enough that you brought it up as something to remember, but we all fell victim this year to Sammy Watkins, to... To TJ, not, not all of us. Well, sh no, but yes, even you were like, yeah, I yeah. guess I've got to admit yeah, I was no, you're wrong. Right. You're right, but you weren't wrong. And TJ Hawkinson comes out and and dominates in week one. You know, you had John Ross and Philip Dorsett look like, oh, the 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 real deal on these speedsters is here. And uh, you know, on the flip side. You have guys like Mike Evans, who was the wide receiver seventy nine in Week One, while while Chris Godwin is oh no, right? Mike Evans is dead, or or the running back three on the year in Aaron Jones, who was the running back fifty two Week One. It's like oh, see, this was the it, and the the issue becomes when what you hoped happen does happen. If you were anti Aaron Jones or you were pro Sammy Watkins, or you know. It, it confirms the bias already, and you, and you overreact so much. And what's funny is if you look at the season, this happens every single week of the year. Every week, you know, it's like, oh, Will Fuller this week was the wide receiver one and was unbelievable. But you don't, you don't take it as truth when it's week eight because there's a larger set of data and you know it hasn't happened every week. But when week one hits, there's this – We've talked so long about football, and now we get to see what the truth is. That's how we feel. And I want to make sure that coming into this next year, I don't recommend people going by and, you know, and it's one of those things. I think you things. hit on it. I think you hit on the actual psychological issue there. The confirmation, the confirmation bias? Because you want to declare victory. Yes, week one victory laps are the best. Do you, do you remember when we were extremely anti-Matt Forte? I think it was a Jets year. Yes. And he yeah. came out for the first week or two of the season. Oh. And he, he lit it up. <laughs> and, like, we lost, but we we didn't lose, but we totally, completely lost. Mm -hmm. Like, over the course of the year, wasn't the same thing as what you got in those first two weeks. But it is very, very difficult not to kind of, you know, put the check mark down that you did get it right or you did get it wrong. It's hard to breathe. Yeah, so... Next year, for all of us, not not just the three of us, but everyone playing, make sure you don't overreact to that week one. Don't sell the guys that sucked. Don't buy the guys that blew up. Breathe. Give yourself a little bit of time. I heard the end is the beginning is the end. That's what I heard. <laughs> I heard a U2 song. Exactly. All right. Number five. Funny that yours was a like a reminder, refresher tip, because mine is as well, and I mm. just – People need to hear this over and over and over. Early quarterbacks aren't safe. Just because they were great last year and it's a quarterback, oh, they're going to be great again. Early quarterbacks are not safe. Only one quarterback drafted in the top five finished in the top five. That was Deshaun Watson. He was drafted as the second quarterback, finished as the QB4. The top three quarterbacks off the board in the draft – they finished an average of four and a half spots below their draft spot. Only Russell Wilson, shockingly, of course, we've got to bring this up, but Russell Wilson was the only guy in the top ten who actually provided a positive return on what you paid for him. But not really. Yeah, I mean, that's from consistency. That's, that's a whole different discussion. 
But the point is, people get really excited about these early round quarterbacks, and things happen. Like we get things wrong. You get things wrong. Everyone in the draft. How dare you? <laughs> I'm just saying, in the draft, people get things wrong. And when you are spending that third or fourth round pick, because Jason, I hear you talking like, yeah, if Lamar Jackson's there in the fourth. So I'm reminding you, early round quarterback, it, they're not safe just because they're a quarterback. And when you are wrong on a quarterback, it's far more devastating to take one in the third round and be wrong. You're going to be wrong about wide receivers or running backs in the third round, but they're so much more valuable when they hit. Late round quarterback was, was again a great year for this strategy with Dak and Lamar. And, and it's a, going on every year running. Continue. Yes, it, and, and it will continue to go. Now, Lamar Jackson, of course, could be the number one guy again next year, but what is the like? What is the, really the benefit when you can get a guy later? And if and if you are wrong, like when you were wrong on Patrick Mahomes, that that really really hurt your draft. Well, and I think you hit on the argument that is made is at least well, if I choose to spend on one, at least I know it's safe. Exactly, that's they, the it's, illusion. It's not safe, right? I like that. Number four. All right. No country for old running backs. Mm -mm. Oh, mamas, don't let your boys <laughs> grow up to be running backs. No position ages quite like the running back position, and we can call this our maybe the, the one with a little bit more of a dynasty focus, a keeper focus, a keeper spin. Uh, we've talked about it before. I thought it would be interesting to look back at the top 30 overall picks in 2018 and look at the wide receivers in that group out of that top 30 look at the running backs this is two, 2018 was not long ago wide receivers drafted in the top 30 a b hopkins beckham julio michael thomas keenan allen Devontae adams aj green mike evans stefan diggs tyreek and hilton one of those guys might have aged out right that might have been that if I want to concede A.J. Green's career as an – and who knows? But I can give A.J. Green. If you look at the running backs in that stretch, Gurley, Bell, D.J., Zeke, Kamara, Barkley, Gordon, Fournette, Hunt, McCaffrey, Cook, Howard, Freeman, Mixon, McKinnon, McCoy. Oh, McKinnon. Now, depending on how you <laughs> oh, want McKinnon. to read their decline, right. I count seven or eight running backs in that top 30 stretch that might have aged out of the position. What do you mean? LaShawn McCoy is a Super Bowl champion this year. You make a strong point. <laughs> Got the it's ring. funny because I walked into one of our bathrooms here and there was a shady painting up on that. And he's in the bathroom for a reason now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the reality, this is not saying, now don't, don't hear me wrong. Running back's the most important position. I'm always going to, in a redraft league, I'm going to be hitting those running backs. I'm going to hit them hard. I'm gonna, that's who I prefer to draft at the top of the draft but you have to be mindful of this in dynasty leagues well, you don't put running backs on autopilot and in redraft you do need, need to be mindful of the age. fact that you know look at this past year right devonta freeman lev mm -hmm. bell todd Gurley, david johnson those are four upper echelon picks that hit a wall in some way shape or form whether it was workload impacted because of the wall whether it was performance on the field uh it's still the most important position but you cannot autopilot running backs, especially in dynasty keeper situations where you think you've got a guy forever. That doesn't mean there aren't running backs that have long, sustainable careers, but they do not prove that all of them will. There, for every Frank Gore, Adrian Peterson, there are players with very limited shelf lives. Well, and if you, ju if you just look at you know the statistical peak of running backs – it's younger than you think. The statistical right. peak of running backs is 24 years old. It's not like, you know, that's like from that point on, they start going down. And so it's like if we talk about this wide receiver who's 25, that's a young buck. He has not hit his prime yet. He has not started. It's like a 38, 39-year-old podcaster. I mean, just right in the, <laughs> exactly. in the peak. So, yeah, I mean, running backs, young guys come in, they do it quicker, and they fall off much, much younger. Uh, we've always talked about the 30-year-old age cliff, and that's, you know, a little bit of a misnomer. But when you talk about just declining value, it's, it's well before then. And the truth is you'd love to have the 
the autopilot running back. You'd love to have the guy that you know you can put in there because they're hard to find. They're such an anchor for your team in a dynasty or a keeper league, but it's just very difficult to find them. Wait for it. Yeah, the button doesn't work. Oh, oh I no. Think, I think number three is. Num- got, what? That's four. No, three won't oh, play. All right, I got you. Number three. <laughs> so a lot of people will say, like, who does our voiceover? And now you know. Yeah. Now it's you, you. Now you know it's me. Hold on. Let me hit it again. Okay. Number three. There we go. Number three. Oh, I, I, I yeah, you hit it twice. All right. Whoops. Um. All right. So mine. This my my last thing to remember here is really it's for myself. Uh, I want to take more risks with rookies, and the reason that this is like something I want to remember is because I went back. You know, we we always we, we look at what we get right. We look at what we get wrong. We look at how close we were right how far off we were uh, when we were wrong. And so when I'm getting ready for the Ultimate Draft Kit 2020 and I'm putting in everybody's statistics from 2019 so that, you know, the the, uh, software that we've developed that we use to stat people out, when we put a player's name in, it shows what they did last year and breaks down a bunch of stuff. So, you know, um, I was putting in this last year and it gave us this small period of time where we could check how we projected everybody with where their actual finishes were statistically, every single stat. And I was very, very impressed with one Andrew Holloway's um, rookie statistics. Mm. And I noticed across the board, it wasn't a scouting thing where I was wrong on players that I liked. But when I liked a guy and Andy liked a guy, rookie specifically coming in, Andy would stat them out much more aggressively than I allowed myself to do in the pre-draft rankings, and he hit some of these guys so stinking close. And I don't, I don't know, Mike, where where you were because this was oh, a right day on that the nose, right on the nose. You, but yes, perfect. Um, don't check it. So, well, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Just trust me. You weren't there that day when we were going back and forth through all of these different rookies. Um, and so I, I just noticed that for myself, I was too timid to believe. And, and while I do think it's important to remember rookie wide receivers, even the great ones, they break out more the second half than the first half. That was one of the things to remember last year. Look at AJ Brown. Awesome. But that was Debo a, broke out in Debo, the second half. Awesome. But those were second half. But in general, across the board, I want to be more aggressive with statting of rookies. And if you combine that with the fact that this is known to be a very, very good rookie draft class, I want to take more risks. I want to be – I think that 2020 is going to be a year to be a little bit risky when it comes to grabbing a rookie, starting them early. Uh, you know, how long did you wait before you believed in Terry McLaurin? You know, how long before, uh, you know, Marquise Brown were you willing to – Put them in your lineup. And so I want to, uh, like, uh, looking back at my process, my starts, my sits, my stats, I think I want to take more risks with the 2020 rookies. So, so are, you, are you changing how you draft them? I am going to change how I draft them a little bit, yeah, because I'm, I'm going to adjust their season rankings accordingly. I think it'll be more accurate. That'll be a little bit more bullish. And the thing is, is maybe, you know, Debo – you were you couldn't really use him in the beginning of the season. Correct. So there's a swing and a miss. But if you do the same thing with Terry McLaurin, you're going to hit on some of these guys. And running backs, we, we all know this. Rookie running backs are phenomenal. Draft rookie running backs, draft them left, right, and center. Um, and so I think it'll affect all of the positions. I mean, look at Kyler Murray. He came out this year. He finished as the quarterback eight despite having a, 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 a lousy second, you know, or I would say last quarter of the year. Um, so I want to be more bullish and more risky, uh, less afraid with rookies. I'm going to take a risk, and I'm going to try to push this button again. Number two. Yay, we're back, baby. It sounded just like Jason. Yeah, it's, it was, that was me. Incredible. This one is entitled, Just Like My Weight, TDs Fluctuate. And look. <laughs> Wait, what? Touchdowns. Touchdowns. Yeah. <laughs> Those also fluctuate. Yes. I'm not just talking about players because we already know that touchdowns are not a sticky stat from year to year. But I want to talk about when you're trying to to break down the trend of like what's going on with the wide receivers. I think it's it's a difficult thing to look at the top 10 wide receivers. What advantage were they giving you? 
because last year we had 797 passing touchdowns. And that was actually that was down from 847 the previous year. So look at the top 10 wide receivers. What happened? The top 10 wide receivers last year had 85 total touchdowns compared to 98 the year before. It, I mean, it, and you can look at like Antonio Brown was gone. He's a touchdown monster. Just Those are variables that I'm not factoring in right now. But I'm saying that passing touchdowns, they go all over the place from 797 to 847, 741, 786. And then back in 2015, you had 842. Like, it's not a situation where you where I feel confident enough looking at the trend of what is happening with the top 10 wide receivers and saying they're losing value. So the, the, that's what the overarching point of this is, that, that the touchdowns will fluctuate. I'm not looking at the, the wide receivers in the second round and saying, nope, I'm, I'm going to pass on these uh, I'm going to pass on these higher end wide receivers because they're they're not giving me the advantage that they did. I'm going to take another risk on a second round running back, even though he's tier three or whatever in my rankings. So so that's a process that I will be looking at. Uh, where are where are wide receivers ranking in ADP and don't and not being afraid that the the decline of the high end wide receiver is actually happening. Yeah, and within the position, one of the nice things you can do or or look at is take away touchdown production from all wide receivers just as as like an exercise and, and running backs as well say okay if 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 you got no points for touchdowns and you could do this in the ultimate draft kit just for a second zero out say touchdowns are worth zero points and then just look at okay so who's the volume plays right. who are the players that we expect to be doing the most on the field because touchdowns while you know you could say okay well you know Devonte adams has a history of it or obviously derrick henry looks like a real touchdown machine they really, really are not sticky. So you can look at the volume apart from touchdowns and, and maybe help, you know, have that help. Uh, Inform. Yes, that yeah. was the word. Yeah. I was looking for. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Let's get to number one. Number one. All right. It's familiar, but it's important. And that is, of course, tell 50 friends about the Fantasy Footballers podcast. Mm. If you stop at 40... <laughs> You are. I'm ashamed of you. This year's challenge is to beat Foot Clan members, <laughs> and we recommend 50. And do you want to do the bare no, minimum? Maybe you. you know. Yeah. All right. That's not the real number one tip, although it, it obviously is the best one. I liked it better. If you want to do that as well, it's fine. Number one thing to remember from 2019, of course, is fix your league. Fix it. Fix it right now. It's not one. later. Step one is identify the problem. Yes. Step two. Step two. Fix it. Do you have a week 17 championship? I hope not. I got, I've got. i heard from a few people they felt like they were personally shamed on this podcast because we uh, would disparage or make fun of the week 17 title game players. They wanted us to understand that they were, they were in that bed. That bed had been made mm -hmm, for them. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, while I say I'm sorry – to the six percent i also remind you we gave you a week's worth of content that was not as fun to do <laughs> because we're not in any week 17 championship games because we fixed it in february and and the reason why every year we we bring this up because this is the time of year to fix it. when you get right up it next to your draft it's too late everyone is already their expectations of what they're drafting what they're doing how the league is formatted that's when they are the least willing to change, the least willing to uh, think about. I don't want to think about changing to a fab system for waivers. I don't want to think about you know changing to a week sixteen championship or or moving from standard to to half point per reception. I, I'm I'm looking at my actual draft and preparing. Now is the time to float these ideas. And those would be our our three biggest ideas, right? Get rid of week seventeen, move to fab. Be in half point PPR. Full full PPR is great as as well. We yeah, prefer you, half. Or you want to make that big keeper change. You want to make that transition. You want to be spending the majority of the months to come, free agency, the draft, the offseason, camp, thinking about players, thinking about your draft, not thinking about structural changes to your league, which is why it is a good thing to remember right now. Also, if, if for the first time that we can really start to say this, um, all of the Week 17ers out there, we love you. 
Um, we do. It's not we you, do. It's not you. It's your league. Um, but soon the NFL will be <laughs> extending the season potentially. I believe in 2021 to a 17-game season. That is the perfect opportunity. As well, I mean, that's a little too far away. Fix it now. But, you know, just say, we don't need to move it to the last week. Second to last week. Second to last You're week. You're just trying to give them an angle. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Which just is sometimes all it takes. Sometimes you need something to go to your league with because it is so much easier to say, let's do what we've always done. Nobody's ever had a problem with it as opposed to let's fix something that's super broken and is antiquated and doesn't involve any actual skill because week 17 championship games are annoying. Mm-hmm. I like you, that Jason's preparing for 2021. <laughs> right now, get the a time. hold of your life. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Any other ones we want to mention there? This would be commissioner, uh, you know, shape up time. Maybe it means transitions at the commissioner position of your league. Maybe it means switching platforms. I mean, look, we've all played the game of summer's coming up. I've got four months to get this beach bod ready. <laughs> And all of a sudden, you're looking down going, I've got three, three weeks months. Oh, yeah, three weeks. <laughs> to get this beach pod ready, and then it's too late. You just don't want to be in don't the... Progress. Don't have a beach bod. Don't have a flabby don't, league. Yeah, don't have a dad bod league. Oh, man. <laughs> oh. This league's got abs. <laughs> That's what I were saying. <laughs> give, give your league a chance at abs. Yes. Just a chance, all right? At least a four-pack. Just a... <laughs> Yeah. Two, Just a little peak ski. A little two-pack. All right. We're going to do a couple mailbag questions before we close it out. Mailbag. Bang, oh bang. Yeah. All right. If you have a question for the show, we love helping you out. Head to the website, thefantasyfootballers.com. Click the submit a question button, or you can dial our voicemail hotline. That's 302-464-TFFB. Let's go. Uh, let's go with this one from Chris. Chris has a dynasty startup draft question. He says, "I have the number one pick in a startup dynasty draft, and I'm thinking Mahomes over Lamar, or should I be taking CMC or Barkley?" What do you guys think? Well, well no, 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 no. You can't ask the question yet because you need the other details of it. It's a half point PPR, two quarterback. Two quarterback. Sorry, sorry, two quarterback dynasty because league. that changes everything. If you're and talk- they draft soon. This, if this is a single quarterback league, there is 0% chance that I'm entertaining taking Lamar or Mahomes with my number one pick. It's a two-quarterback league. Honestly, I would prefer not to I because I think there's still a ton of value that you can get from veteran quarterbacks and then just kind of keep that cycle going. I get that having Lamar or Mahomes feels real, real exciting that you have them now for Dynasty, you have them forever. I, and I'll, so I'll cede it to Jason because I think his answer is different than mine. Yeah, it is. Uh, if I've got the number one pick in a two quarterback league where you're you're starting to um, streaming off the waivers is never going to be an option in a dynasty league. I would take Mahomes with the one one. I and I would take him over Lamar because I think longevity of career. We we've looked at this in the past. Running quarterbacks, they look they can have a great stretch. This isn't saying oh Lamar's done and he's going to be injured next year. Yeah, we've seen Cam Newton do it for for yeah. many many many. But many Cam, Cam Newton's thirty and it's starting to look like right. the end. You know, whereas all these pocket passing quarterbacks, even the mobile ones, you know, Aaron he's Rodgers, more, he's is, really more of a Rodgers where he right. he can run when he needs to run. But those guys can play into their late thirties. And so Mahomes is is the guy that I would take, and I and I believe that you know you, I don't think Lamar Jackson's leading the NFL in in passing touchdowns next year like he did this year. Um, so if I had to pick a quarterback, and so let let me phrase it this way, because you're taking Mahomes with your number one pick, so you are okay with the fact that your starting running back, your your RB one or your RB two is now pick. 24? No, usually it's later than that for me, Mike. I mean, I when I do a dynasty startup draft, I'm I'm focused on wide receivers usually. So, I'm used to going well, that's what into, I mean, so your wide receiver one is pick 24. Yeah, I, I I think in a in a two quarterback league, all right. You know, you could say, "Oh, well, you know, your quarterback is worse, my wide receiver is worse." Ryan on Facebook says, "What what would you be willing to sell CMC for in a dynasty league?" We did just Go over 10 things to remember. One of the ones I brought up was running backs aging out at some point in time in a dynasty 
format. Depends if if I'm playing to win right now, you can't you probably can't offer me enough. If I'm playing if I'm looking at my team as a championship team this year, it doesn't matter. I'm not selling him. Joe Mixon and Mike Evans. No. Okay. Mm, well, Evans is Evans is tough to say no to. But the the point is it, it, you have to look at your situation first. Kristen Michael. <laughs> yes. Okay. For the do I get I get him in the XFL though. Yes. Excellent. So think of a realistic price of you are you're a rebuild team or you're just you're like a fringe playoff team. What would it take, Jason, to get you to sell Christian McCaffrey? The one Well, it's it's basically how many what, first round picks? You say a replacement player and like several firsts. Right. I mean, if if you've got a couple of first round picks and a great wide receiver that would be at least tempting, especially if you are in more of a rebuild mode where you can capitalize on the extreme value. I I don't think there's a lot of teams out there in a that feel like they're in a rebuild mode who have Christian McCaffrey because he was so good this year, you were in it. You could you could fill a lot of holes with him. So I don't think that now is the time to sell. He's 23 years old right now. I think, you know, that's that's you the let thing. another year or two go and sell him high. It, Andy, you I have sold been early. you yeah. you have been so stinking good at selling running backs at the right time at their peak, but right before the collapse. Um, so when would you sell? Yeah, Christian I have McCaffrey? no in, I have no inkling, indication, or desire to sell Christian McCaffrey right now. Yeah, you you do try to find you know there were there were reasons to move on from Gurley when I moved on. Well, I when, don't see reasons to move on from McCaffrey at 23 years old with the record-breaking numbers and the foundational aspect he has to a team. To see a season like that on a losing team, knowing that this could be a top five well, and think about draft pick team 2021. To, because if he does want to move on from Chris McCaffrey, your haul that you got for Gurley, you got Dalvin Cook, I think a couple of first-rounders, another player. I, I forget what it was, but you got like a monstrous haul. Yeah. For Todd Gurley, yeah. so you're not just getting like I think it's well more than a Mixon and and Mike Evans. If it, uh, it doesn't hurt you, if you're in a position where you don't think you'll be competitive over the next year or two, to float it to your league and say ah, I'm thinking about this because the teams that are on the precipice, they may come with uh, some kind of offer you don't expect. You never need to you, having the the stance, the posture of never on a player is just not one that I subscribe to. I'm going to give you Josh Jacobs in the 105 for Christian McCaffrey, Jason. Will you accept no. that deal? No. Okay. No. That's I'm, not I'm a close. no. Nope. I'm going to give you Josh Jacobs, the 105, and a second-round pick. No. no. It would be right. not close. If you give me Josh Jacobs and the 101 and the 105, okay. now I'm like, okay, well, I'm, I'm interested. That's a, that's a good offer. That's a good offer. All right, that'll do it for the Fantasy Footballers today. Thank you for all of your support, subscribing, reviewing the show. Check out ultimatedraftkit.com to pre-order at the very best price. Don't good. forget. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers. And Foot Clan, don't forget that the actual trade that Andy made was he traded uh, Todd Gurley and Equinemius St. Saint Brown. I don't even remember his <laughs> Equinemius. name. Equinemius. Equinemius St. Brown for Dalvin Cook, Robbie Anderson, the 103, the 203, and the 211. Hoo-ha! That's pretty good. Kill!